uh, you know that we have come to the point of our really being here this evening, uh, and that is to honor with the Norman Cousins Global Governance Award, uh, Walter Cronkite. We are proud to present to you this amethyst geode. Uh, and I hope all of you will take the opportunity at the conclusion of the program uh, to come up and examine it. We're not worrying about anybody carrying it off. Uh, it's too heavy for me to lift. Uh, but uh, it illustrates a very important lesson. The crystals of a geode are formed within another rock that serves as the foundation for their fragile beauty. Uh, the rock provides the structure necessary for the crystals to grow. And in similar fashion, world government is the structure necessary for global justice. You, sir. You, sir, have been a lifelong advocate of this principle, and it is appropriate, therefore, that we present you with this amethyst geo. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, there are many of us here who had wished back a couple of decades ago that we had been addressing you with Mr. President in a slightly different <laughs> environment. And thank you, Ms. Lennon, for those lovely words you spoke. I will treasure them. And I'm greatly honored, quite obviously, by the Norman Cousins Global Government Governance Award. I'll try to get it right since I will be referring to it frequently, of course, from now on. Uh, first, uh, I, well, there are two reasons really why I'm particularly grateful and honored by this award. Uh, the first, uh, I, I, I believe, as Norman Cousins did, that the first priority of humankind in this difficult era is to establish an effective system of world law that will assure peace with justice among the peoples of all the world. <laughs> but uh, second, I, uh, I feel rather sentimental uh, about this award and this organization because half a century ago, Norman Cousins offered me a job as the spokesman and the Washington lobbyist for the really nascent uh, organization called World Federalists. <laughs> I, uh, I was honored. He and Oscar Hammerstein, Hammerstein met me in the Waldorf and twisted my arm quite vigorously to get me to take the job, to take the place of Ted Waller, who was the first lobbyist and a noted supporter of the World Federalist movement. I chose instead, uh, it turned out, to continue in the world of journalism. Uh, for many years, I did my best to report on the issues of the day with as much fairness uh, as I possibly could, in objective a manner as uh, is possible to achieve. When I had my own strong opinions, I tried to put them aside for the moment in the interest of fairness. I didn't communicate them, I hope, to my audience. Now, however, now, however, my circumstances are considerably different. I'm in a position to speak my mind, and by God, I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know, those of us who are living today can truly influence the future of civilization. We can influence whether our planet is going to live or die whether it's going to drift into chaos and violence, or whether through a monumental educational and political effort, a monumental effort, we will achieve a world of peace under a system of law where individual violators of that law are brought to justice. For how many thousands of years now have we humans been what we insist on calling civilized? 
And yet, in total contradiction, we also persist in the savage belief that we must occasionally at least settle our arguments by killing each other. While we spend much of our time and a great deal of our treasure in preparing for war, we see no comparable effort in establishing peace. Meanwhile, emphasizing the sloth in this regard, those advocates who work for world peace by urging a system of world law and order, world government, if you please, are called impractical dreamers. Those impractical dreamers are entitled, it seems to me, to ask their critics, what is so darn practical about war? Of course, we Americans are going to have to yield up some of our sovereignty. That's going to be, to many, a bitter pill. It would take a lot of courage, a lot of faith, a lot of persuasion to them to come along with us on this necessity. Our forefathers believed that the closer the laws are to the people, the better. Cities legislate on local matters, of course. States make decisions on the matters within their borders. And the national government deals with issues that transcend the states, such as interstate commerce, foreign relations. That's what we mean by federalism. Today, we must develop federal structures on a global level. To deal with world problems, we need a system of enforceable world law, a democratic federal world government. You know, what Alexander Hamilton wrote about the need for law among the 13 states applies today to the approximately 200 sovereignties in our global village, all of which are going to have to be convinced to give up some of that sovereignty to the better, greater union. Hamilton said... And it's not going to be easy. Hamilton said, to look for a continuation of harmony between a number of independent, unconnected sovereignties in the same neighborhood would be to disregard the uniform course of human events and to set at defiance the accumulated experience of ages. Today, the notion of unlimited national sovereignty means international anarchy. We must ex replace the anarchic law of force with the civilized law of, uh, of law, force of law. Ours will, that's water. <laughs> you know, Churchill used to say, nearly every speech at some point he'd reach for a little glass he'd take a slip and he'd say uh, that's water you know water <laughs> except he lied <laughs> <laughs> ours is never going to be a perfect world for heaven's sakes we all know that Not a, there can't be a world without some disagreement probably occasional violence but it will be a world where the overwhelming majority of national leaders will consistently abide by the rule of world law if we have our way and can sell our program. And those who won't obey the law, the international law with which we'll be governed, are going to be dealt with effectively and with due process of the structures of that same world law. We're, you know, we're never going to have a city without crime. We're never, but we, we, we certainly would never want to live in a city without law a law to deal with the criminals who are always among us. Not here in it this evening, you understand. <laughs> the three suggestions with which I've been furnished uh, for immediate action that would move us in the direction firmly in the American tradition of law and democracy are these. First, keep our promises, for heaven's sakes. Keep our promises. We help create the United Nations, of course. We help develop the UN assessment formula by which it is financed. Americans overwhelmingly, I think, every poll shows it, wants us to pay our UN dues. Yeah. Wants us to pay them with no, none of these crippling limitations that we, with our arrogance, seem to want to impose. We owe it to the world. In fact, we owe it, not only the world, we owe it as well to our national self-esteem. How embarrassing it is to go among the peoples of the world knowing what they know 
about our niggardliness. Please get that word right if anybody quotes me uh, at the United Nations. And second, ratify the treaty. Ratify several treaties. Ratify the treaty, for goodness sakes, to ban landmines. Why can't we understand that? Our representatives worked hard and long to get the Law of the Sea Treaty, and we haven't ratified it even. Selfish interests to dictate, not the national interest or the international interest. The comprehensive, these are other treaties we haven't ratified. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, as you know. <laughs> a, a treaty with the catchy phrase, catchy title, the Convention to Eliminate All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the title may not be catchy, but the idea certainly is. <laughs> and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We haven't even done that. Most important, we should sign and ratify the Treaty for a Permanent International Criminal Court. That is now at the core of the World Federalist Movement's drive. That court will enable, enable the world to hold individuals accountable for their crimes against humanity. And the third point, just consider, if you will, after 55 years, the possibility of a more representative and democratic system of decision-making at the UN. This should include both revision of the veto in the Security Council and adoption of a weighted voting system in the General Assembly. <laughs> Our organization, the World Federalists, have endorsed Richard Hudson's binding triad proposal. George Soros, in his recent book, The Crisis of Global Capitalism, has given serious attention to this concept, which would be based upon not only the one nation, one vote, but also on population, and contributions to the UN budget. Res resolutions adopted by majorities in each of these three areas would then be binding, enforceable law. Within the powers given it in the Charter, the UN could then deal with matters of reliable financing, a standing UN peace force, development, the environment, and, of course, human rights. Some of you may ask, although I think most of you know the answer, why the Senate is not ratifying these important treaties and why the Congress is not even paying our UN dues. Even as with the American rejection so many years ago now of the League of Nations after World War I, our failure to live up to our obligations to the United Nations is led by a handful of willful senators who choose to pursue their narrow, selfish political objectives at the cost of our nation's conscience. They pander to and are supported by the Christian coalition and the rest of the religious right wing. Their leader, Pat Robertson, has written in a book a few years ago that we should have a world government, but only when the Messiah arrives. <laughs> he wrote, and literally, any attempt to achieve world order before that time must be the work of the devil. Well, join me. I'm, I'm glad to sit here at the right hand of Satan. <laughs> the only way we can do it is to organize a strong educational counteroffensive, stretching from the most publicly visible people in all fields to the humblest individuals in each of our communities. That's the vision and the program of the World Federalist Association. It begins with education, and it ends with success and hope. <laughs> Let us hear the peal of a new international liberty bell that calls us all to the creation of a system of enforceable world law in which the universal desire for peace can place its hope and its prayers as Carl Van Doren has written, history is now choosing the founders of the World Federation. That was back there at the beginning. And he said, any person who can be among that number 
and fails to do so has lost the noblest opportunity of a lifetime. Thank you. We would like to bring you a message from the First Lady of the United States, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Good evening and congratulations, Walter, on receiving the World Federalist Association's Global Governance Award. For more than a generation in America, it wasn't the news until Walter Cronkite told us it was the news. Every night at 6 o'clock, we welcomed you into our living rooms and listened as you explained the complex events of the day. Whether it was the space race or the Vietnam War, presidential elections, or peace treaties, you were there telling us in simple yet riveting prose what was happening. You became a trusted member of my family and of families across America. For decades, you told us the way it is. But tonight, we honor you for fighting for the way it could be. We honor you for lending your voice to the cause of human rights around the world and for your lifelong commitment to international human rights law. From your reporting on the Nuremberg trials to your work with the WFA campaign to end genocide, you have stirred our consciences and challenged all of us to live closer to the words of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. So thank you, Walter. Thank you for inspiring all of us to build a more peaceful and just world. We are still listening to your every word. And with your continuing leadership, we can sail across these unnavigated seas into the 21st century. And there's no better captain I can imagine than you. Thank you. Thank you.